My name is John Kenny. On the deep web, I'm known as Jay-Z. <laughs> and I'm a developer. With me today, I have uh, Scott Colton, who's our operations expert. So Scott and I are doing a, a two-part talk. We're uh, developing and deploying an application to production. So the first part is the Docker for developers. That's what you're in right now. And then Docker for Ops is uh, right after lunch in this room, so you don't want to miss that. So I'm a developer for IBM. Um, I worked, I've worked a little bit on the OpenWhisk uh, project, which is a serverless framework. I'm also a, well, we're, Scott and I are both Docker captains. There's, a, there's so much energy at these DockerCon conferences, and there's always a million things going on, but uh, you know, if you guys get the chance, you should always go out and try to explore something unique to the location. So DockerCon last year, I got out to Olympic National Park to go hiking. And then DockerCon this year, obviously it's not over yet, but uh, I went to Congress Street Bridge, and there's apparently a bunch of bats that live under it, and they all come out at the same time at sunset. Uh, so that was pretty cool. So I'm a developer, and I'm kind of a lazy developer. And that's actually the reason why, how I started using Docker. I had multiple um, applications that I was trying to deploy, and they had conflicting dependencies. So my solution was to containerize these applications so that they can run isolation on the same virtual machine. For the same project, we ended up containerizing our entire service-oriented architecture, and then we had full automated, fully automated deployments to production. So today's talk, I'm gonna tell you a story about a, a friend of mine. It's someone that I've turned to several times throughout my professional career, and it seemed that no matter what, he can always put a smile on my face. My friend is uh, Michael Bolton from the movie Office Space. Uh, so Michael Bolton is a developer just like me, and he works for an evil corporation called Initech. So one day Michael gets the idea to create an application to rip off his company and to make himself rich. So his app idea takes advantage of his company software, which computes transactions, um, computes interest on transactions thousands of times per day. And the company software typically rounds to two decimal places and then drops the remainder. What Michael's app does is it just redirects that remainder and it puts it into his bank account. So the idea is that he's stealing money from Initech, but Initech would never find out about it. So Michael's a good developer, and as any good developer would, he thoroughly tested his application to make sure that it works before deploying to the production environment. However, only after a few hours of running his application, he had stolen a very large amount of money, which is not good because Initech was gonna notice. So luckily for Michael, if you've seen the movie, you know how it ends. Uh, everything works out in his favor. But what I wonder, so the question I have now is, would things have been different for Michael if he had used Docker for his applications? So I think to help answer that question, I think it helps understand where did Michael go wrong in the first place? So Michael's problem was that he was a victim of environmental drift. The production environment we deployed to was not the same as the development environment we tested his app on. And this disparity can be caused if you're updating one environment without pushing the same updates to the rest. So Michael has a big problem in that he can't, uh, his app isn't working in production. What makes it 100 times worse is that he can't reproduce the issues locally in his machine. And that's your works on my machine syndrome. So this is what Michael wanted to happen. Deploy his app to um, completely identical environments and have it work in both environments. But what actually happened was a security vulnerability, security vulnerability was found in the production environment, and then Lumberg shows up, and he decides that he's gonna fix the issue. The problem is that when Lumberg stopped by Michael's desk on Friday afternoon to tell him that he was gonna work on Saturday, he forgot to mention that he applied this patch to production. So now it's Saturday, Michael's in the office, he's deploying his application, and when he gets to production, it fails. So the bottom line here is that it's more than just your code that affects how your application runs. Your code has a lot of other dependencies. Um, and if these dependencies are consistent across your environments, you're good to go. But there's a lot of different reasons for this environmental drift. So security patch is a good example. 
Um, provisioning environments at different times is another example. Um, Long-standing environments have a particular uh, problem here because they have the opportunity to accumulate long or lots of small little updates over time. So as developers, it's really easy to blame the system administrator for this. Surely it's their fault that our money-stealing application isn't working in production. But uh, what I wonder is, if this, is there something that we can do as developers to prevent this sort of thing from happening? And, uh, you know, so as developers, we tend to focus on our code. We test our code. We version control. We have build and test automation. We create uh, immutable uh, code artifacts. And, uh, but then when we have all this other stuff that we kind of just assume is, you know, we take it for granted, it's going to be the same on every environment. However, if you've experienced works on my machine syndrome before, you know that's not a great assumption to make. So what would be great is if we can apply the best practices that we think about when we code our, when we develop, develop our code and apply those same best practices to, um, to include everything that our application depends on to run successfully. So to this, we can uh, package this up into a single unit of abstraction or a, a Docker container. So containers allow you to package your application, uh, including your dependencies, and they run in isolation. So if you have a conflicting host or a conflicting dependency installed on your host, uh, you don't have to worry about that. It's, uh, conceptually, it's similar to virtual machines, but it's much faster and much lighter, which really enables developers to use it for packaging their applications and integrate into automation such as CICD. Now, container technology, be, container technology has been around for uh, quite a long time. But Docker came along and really enabled the uh, widespread use of containers. So they created a developer-friendly user experience, which allowed developers to take advantage of that and integrate with their application development. So now you know, we have the best practices for our code. Let's extend that to include our, our, all the dependencies that our application needs to run. We have our version control, our Docker file, which defines our dependencies. For our build artifacts, we're not just building a code archive, we're creating a Docker image. And then we're testing that image and validating it before uh, going to production. So Michael Bolton gets smart, he dockerizes his application. And even though Longberg is here to screw around with the production environment, he deploys his Docker container and it works in both environments. So now uh, Michael Bolton is not spending a lot of time debugging environmental issues which means he has a lot more time to spend on the things that are important, like making sure that there's a cover sheet on all of his TPS reports. So we're going to take a deeper dive into this Office Spaces example. Uh, we're going to use uh, Docker Compose to get it running. We'll do some live debugging. I'll show you multi-stage builds, which is a new feature. And then we're going to hand off to operations, um, where Scott will take it from there in his talk, Docker for Ops. But first, um, Scott, I think we need a little help to set up some of the infrastructure that we're going to deploy to for production. So can you help us with that? Yeah. So what we're going to do, me and John spoke around the water cooler, is we actually want to take the money as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a highly distributed application framework um, using Docker UCP. And then we're going to make sure that the security team at Initech doesn't get into our application. So what we're going to do is we're going to sign our images with Notary. We're going to scan it for vulnerabilities to make sure there's no vulnerabilities in there so they can't get into our code. And then while we deploy the new Initech website, we will deploy our money stealing application. And it will run on the same cluster and we'll do some layer seven load balancing with Nginx dynamically. So yeah, they shouldn't be able to find it. It should be good. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, so now we got the lowdown on that. Uh, let's dive into this application. So I got this money stealing application. Uh, it's open source on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> we have a multi-container architecture here. We got a Java app that computes the interest, deposits the remainder into an account database. And we have a Node.js app that just displays the account balance and a Python app that feeds the system with transactions. So each of these is running in its own container. So if we went into any of these files, then we would see a Docker file at the top level. At the top level of the project, we have a Docker Compose file, which has, allows us to define um, an orchestrated multi-container application. So I have my four services defined in this file. 
From a developer's point of view, Docker Compose really comes in handy when you are used to following like 10 page Word documents to like onboard to a new project. I've done a few of those. Um, you know, with Docker Compose, you don't need to install any dependencies on your machine. They're all running inside of the containers and uh, you can get your application up and running with one command. So we're gonna do that. So I have the projects cloned locally on my host and I can do Docker Compose up to start my application. I'm gonna take a minute to show you um, the new Docker management commands. So this is new last couple months. There's a new set of management commands that just helps organize the CLI. And uh, the old commands still work, but the new commands may, I think make it a lot easier to find exactly what you're looking for. So, oops. So to print the running containers, you can do docker container ls. That's uh, opposed to docker ps. And to do the images, you can do docker image ls. If you've been using Docker for a while, this probably looks familiar to you. All these uh, dangling images that build up on your system over time. We can, uh, we can take care of that by doing a doctor, Docker system prune, which will remove all the dangling images and it'll also remove any unused volumes or networks so it can really clean up your space on your host. And Docker image ls to make sure that stuff's cleaned up. All right, uh, looks like our application is up and running. Let's go to uh, the Node.js app to check out our account balance. I'm on 5001 here. So we've only been running our application for just a couple of seconds, and we've already stolen over $25,000. So money is good. I mean, this makes me happy, but like the whole point of this was that Initech wasn't supposed to find out. So let's debug this issue and figure out what's going on. So I'm a developer. Uh, there's certain tools that I like to use um, to debug applications. It's basically just about me working as efficiently as possible. So I'm gonna demonstrate how to use my IDE and do some remote debugging. And I'm gonna hook up my code so it automatically restarts my application when I edit my code. But first, we need to pass some debug parameters into our Docker containers so that when we run it, we can attach our remote debugger. So if you've been, uh, if you've been paying attention to this project, there's multiple Docker and Compose files defined here. And there's actually a cool thing you can do. You can actually extend Docker Compose files. So I have the base Docker and Compose file, which defines my basic configuration that's running now. And then I have a debug Docker and Compose file where I'm specifying the debug parameters for these applications. So in my Java application, I'm using you know, these debug parameters here. For Node, I'm using Node Monitor, which monitors your code for changes and then restarts your application. And then the debug flag allows you to attach it at remote debugger app port 5858. So uh, I also add these things here. So I'm exposing port 5858 outside of the container that allows me to attach to it from my IDE. And then this volume is mapping my code running locally inside of my container. That way when I'm using my IDE to edit my code, the changes are reflected inside of the container. Node monitor will detect that change and then automatically restart my application. So today we're gonna to look at the debugging this Java application. Actually, first I need to restart it with the debug parameters. So we'll clean this up, docker compose down. And then we'll do docker compose up and we'll reference both files, both the base docker compose file and the debug docker compose file. So the order matters here. Um, basically the first one is applied first and then there's any conflicts, then the, the, the configurations from the second file would be used. So we can wait a couple of seconds. It should pick up, start picking up transactions in just a second. There we go. All right, so now it's running. Uh, we can debug our Java application. So I have my Java application loaded into an Eclipse IDE. Um, really simple application here. I just have one controller with a compute interest function. 
So to debug this application, I'm going to use Spring DevTools. It's a really cool uh, dev tools that development uh, tools that you can use to do some remote debugging for your application. So I'm going to launch that. And then after this starts. OK, now this has started. I'm going to attach a remote debugger. So uh, I'm going to set a breakpoint where I'm updating the account balance. So it looks like I'm adding uh, $115 to my account. And this is incorrect, right? We should only be adding something after two decimal places. Um, and if we look two lines above, there's a line that says remaining interest times equals 100,000 with the comment get rich quick. <laughs> so obviously this is our problem here and uh, we need to remove that. So let's uh, continue our application. We'll save this file. So when we save the file, uh, Spring DevTools will um, basically update or upload the uh, updated class resources to the remote server. And if I go back to Docker and Compose, you can see that my application has been restarted. And then after a few more seconds, after it starts picking up transactions, we can check out our account balance to see how our um, money stealing situation is doing. <clears throat> so you notice we're, uh, we're still stealing money, but at a much slower rate in terms of cents. We run this all day, you know, we're gonna accumulate definitely a, a significant amount of money, especially if you're running this 24 seven. And uh, it's good, I mean, we're making less money, but Anitech is definitely not gonna notice, so uh, that makes it okay. So we just live debug some Docker containers, which if you think about kind of my best practices pitch earlier, right, we want to think more about not just our code, but also include all the dependencies that our application needs to run. When you live debug Docker containers, you're debugging your code as it's running inside of the container based on the dependencies that you've defined in the Docker file. Uh, we're still going to use the modern tools that we know and love, so I like using Spring DevTools to de debug Java applications, and that works. You can also use Node Monitor or whatever tools that you'd like. Using application restarting is really handy because it allows the application to restart inside of the container without having to rebuild and restart the container every time you want to do a code change. So there's one caveat to how my project is set up. And that is that I actually have to have Maven installed locally to do a Maven package before I can do a Docker build for my Java project. And this is my Docker file for my Java project. I have an add, the app.jar, but where did that jar come from, right? I had to compile it. So what might be better than that is to actually put your build dependency inside of the Docker file, right? That way you don't have to have Maven installed locally um, but the downside of this is that now you have Maven inside of your final image that's going to production, and you don't really want to have all of that like unnecessary bloat that you don't need. So the workaround that the community has come up with is called the builder pattern. You have two Docker files, one for building the image and one for your final image, and then you have a script that does a Docker copy to get the archive out of the first into the second. There's a new feature called multi-stage Docker builds that basically allows you to implement the, the builder pattern, but within a single Docker file. So you have the, uh, the first four lines are using, it's using Maven to do a Maven package. And then the second set of lines is your second stage where it does a copy um, from the first stage, the, the jar file that was created. So multi-stage build that allows you to use Docker to specify your build dependencies without adding a bunch of like unnecessary bloat that you don't need for your final image. Um, you know, this benefits any languages with build tools, uh, compiled languages, Maven, Gradle, et cetera. It's available right now in the Edge release, so you can go and download it. The, uh, the only drawback here is that there's currently no way to mount a build cache. So if I do a Maven package, I'm going to download all of those like build dependencies every single time I run it, which is really slow. Um, there is an act, a very active issue on the Docker project, 32507, 
So if you're interested in um, where this is going, like I highly recommend you subscribe to that issue. So I can actually do a quick demo of that. And we're gonna kill this for now. So inside of my Java project, I have two Docker files. And one is a uh, Docker file multi-stage. And this is, this is what I had up on my, uh, on my slide. It's just the two stages, Maven, and then the final image. And then you can do a Docker build multi-stage, and then reference the Docker file multi-stage. Um, so this is running Maven inside of the container, and it's gonna do a Maven package. Like, you can kind of just pretend that I don't have Maven installed on my host. Like, obviously I do, because I was doing this demo. But, um, but you don't need to have Maven installed for this build correctly, to build to work correctly. And the final image that's produced uh, won't have Maven installed. So this takes a little while because I don't have a build cache, so we'll maybe come back to it. All right, so uh, we've made our changes and we fixed our application that we're, so we're stealing not quite as much money as we were before. So let's, um, let's rebuild our images and then we're gonna push it to a central registry to where uh, Scott can then take over in the Docker for Ops talk for, to deploy to production. And honestly, this takes too long, so I'm just gonna kill it. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so I'm not using the multi-stage build, so I have to do a Maven uh, clean package to recompile my Java project. And then I have to do a, uh, and then to build my artifacts, I can use Docker Compose to build my, all of my containers in my, um, my Docker Compose setup. So I can do Docker Compose build. So this will re rebuild all of my containers. And I can do a docker compose push to push this to a central registry where Scott can get access to it in part two. So uh, I think probably a lot of you have seen this image before. You know, so Scott and I are working together on this office space application and uh, using containers makes it a lot easier for us because as a developer, you know, I'm developing four different containers with four different technologies, four different languages, and I can put that stuff inside of a container, and then you know, when Scott comes around to deploy it, then all he needs to do is worry about the standard container interface, right? Uh, so Scott's not the only one that understands the interface, his entire uh, ecosystem of tools that you've probably heard about in the keynote this morning that, uh, that understand this interface, so if you're looking for generic solutions for orchestration or monitoring, uh, et cetera, then you can take advantage of that ecosystem. There's another cool point of handoff between developer and operations, and that is that starting with version three file format for Docker Compose, you can take your Docker Compose file and feed it as input directly into a Docker Swarm. And you can do that via the Docker stack command. 